you've got an anniversary coming up. I think anniversaries are, are, are great times to um, to look back, but also to look forward. Um, first off, just tell us what this anniversary is, and and have a look at you know if you if you don't mind, have a look at back to sort of day day dot and how it's all got has it all gone to plan and what's giving you the most pride. Well, broadly speaking, it has gone to plan. I mean, obviously, there's huge details that vary along the way. But we set out in 2013 when we did our presentations to private equity firms to back us. We had a little grid that said, this is why we think we can grow the company. And they were in four boxes. And box one was organic growth. Uh, box two was new territories. Uh, box three was M&A. And box four was new services. And when we did the same presentation to Sinven on new investors, it's exactly the same page. It hasn't changed at all. We think we can grow, and you grow by being hopefully better than the competitors, better products, better service, better commitment and relationships. New territories, there were places we weren't where we felt we could expand sales. So, for example, we weren't in LATAM, we, weren't, uh, we didn't have a Malaysian office, which we do now, and various other places. We weren't in Singapore, which we are now, courtesy of the French Provident takeover. So that was one. Was, the, the other was um, m and I think one of the reasons that private equity like us is we were sort of business in a box. So we had our own management team, sales, marketing, IT, customer service, whereas a lot of our other companies in our sector are sort of devolved to UK parents or Irish parents or wherever. But we were a business that could be bought. And the next day after the management buyout, we just carried on as normal. There's no IT exit needed or anything. So we said we want to grow, do M&A and explore new territories. And that's still the case today. So it has gone exactly as we hoped. Now, along the way, Things happen you hadn't anticipated. There were one or two companies perhaps we should have bidded for that we didn't. Uh, there were one or perhaps two territories we wanted to explore where because we were so busy doing takeovers, we didn't explore them. Uh, some things took longer. COVID knocked things back a bit in terms of the whole investment, new investor process slowed things down a bit. But by and large, in broad terms, we've actually done exactly what we anticipated except much more successfully than I think we ever hoped. It's been an extraordinary 10 years. One of the questions I wanted to ask is, when you look at this this top 10 years, what is the one thing that stands out that's given you the most pride? You know, you've been the uh, part of a team, but um, the leader of that team. What's been the thing that's given you the most pride? It's difficult to pick one thing. But I think proving ourselves as, as uh, good at takeovers and integrating the businesses and creating one culture and one team out of those is, is tricky. It's expensive. It's hard work. But we've proven ourselves to be a good M&A team. And without, we've never lost the focus of day-to-day -day business as well. Uh, and I think this is something that we take very seriously at the, uh, at, at the company, which is it's easy to get excited by M&A and say, oh, we'll buy that company. But I think there's what I call real world day-to-day -day business to be done. Advisors still need to have good service, good products and good relationships. So we've always kept that balance. And we've always seen that as very important, which is, which is we see ourselves as a quote unquote normal business doing day-to-day -day things. And then every couple of years, a takeover target comes along. But it, it's not what we live for. What we live for is being a good business. And I think maintaining that over the last 10 years has probably been the most difficult thing. Uh, whether it's the thing I'm most proud of, it's tricky to say one thing. Um, but generally speaking, we're the same business we were 10 years ago, except bigger and I hope better. And I think doing that has not been easy. And uh, the management team have been integral to that. And it's very, and I think the stability of the management team is another thing that stands out. I and mean, it's the same bunch of people broadly that did the management buyout. You know what? You just stole my next question. I've been, I've been sort of 
fighting away to to ask that. What's the secret sauce then? How do you keep the all these, you know, big personalities? And you've got look, you are a company filled with big personalities. How do you keep them all happy and you know these ambitious people? Because people do tend to stay when they come to Arrow Three Sixty and IFGL, don't they? It's true. Well, of course, there is one aspect which creates a bit of loyalty, which is that we do have an equity participation scheme for a large number of people within the organisation, and that creates a certain motivation. But I don't think money is the only way in which you keep people motivated. Why do people enjoy the work? They're either driven by money or they're driven by intellectual challenge or they're driven by fun. So I think in our sector, because of our equity participation, we do deliver some financial rewards that are not always easily replicated. But I think we've always had very clear objectives and we've always worked very hard to make those objectives happen, which meant we've grown. We don't sit around much, so we're busy all the time. Once I remember a manager came up to me a few years ago and said, there's all these projects so everybody's very busy. Which ones do you want to focus on? And I went, all of them. <laughs> and I was only half joking. So we do drive people hard and that's not for everyone. But for the managers that either came with me or we brought in, they recognise that and they like that challenge. So I think it's a very challenging environment. It's quite hard working. We push people hard. We expect them to work hard. Uh, and in return for certainly senior management, there's quite good rewards. But the rewards come after the hard work. And because I think a role of a chief executive is to make sure you create a dynamic in the management team, where I think I see everyone as equal. There's no one function that's more important than the other. You know, sales is not more important than marketing. Marketing is not important than sales, which is not more important than customer service and vice versa. All the functions are equal. And if we don't have them all working well, and if all the senior managers don't get on well, we will struggle. And all that I hope all the managers know and the directors know that I, as far as I'm concerned, all the functions are equal. There is no one function more important than the other. And uh, only slightly tongue in cheek, if any, if a, there's ever any slight divergence of opinion between the heads of different functions, um, if they come to me, I, I always work on assumptions, if I'm slightly pissing off both of them, I'm probably getting the balance right. <laughs> so I think that's hugely important. You keep a balance, all the functions know that they all matter equally, and if they don't work together equally, we will not succeed. And everybody knows that. That's a really good answer. It, I'm kind of, you know, I've sent some questions in advance, but I'm just going to sort of jump ahead uh, on the list. There's, it really, I've known you for a few years now, David, and and I've, you know, we've we've done some pretty, you know, pretty widespread revealing interviews in the past. We've done the big interview, and it always fascinates me about what makes a really good CEO. And it was almost like when you moved into this CEO role, this was you began to flourish. And I just want to know what keeps you thriving in this CEO role and what is it that you continue to love about this international space as well? What keeps me personally thriving is, is the challenge. And, and I'm not a spring chicken anymore, working with the management team and all the other staff at the company because it's fun. I mean, some days are harder than others. I'm not saying it's all a barrel of laughs. But broadly speaking, we all get on well. We're all going in the same direction. We all get each other. We all know each other's importance. So I enjoy coming to work. And it's great working with some of the senior management, some of whom you know, and others perhaps not so well. So it's fun and it's challenging. And I like both of those things. Um, why do I like this space? Uh, because it's so different. You know, I can be on the Isle of Man one week, I can be in Hong Kong another week, I can be in Dubai another week. You meet different cultures, different people, different race structures, different regulators, uh, different sense of humour. And um, now I was in Hong Kong a few weeks ago and I'm in Dubai next week. And, every, and I was in uh, Latin America in May. And each time you go on a trip, it's just completely different and different people and they want different things from the company. They're different expectations of what, how we can help them. 
Uh, and I think that divergence or variation of people you deal with and cultures and geographies and even regulators is actually so exciting and so different that I couldn't possibly imagine myself living a world in which I was sitting on a train from Tunbridge to Charing Cross on Cannon Street every day, going into the same office, only dealing with people in London. I think, not that I'm looking for a new job, but I find that pretty dull, it has to be said. So I think the sheer variation of existence in an international company that does international business is so exciting. It has frustrations, sure. Some things take longer to achieve than others because of that. But it's, and it's difficult sometimes because of that, but that also makes it fun and challenging. And you mentioned Hong Kong. It would be, you know, it would, looking back over this sort of 10 years, one thing that stands out, because I've, pr I've pretty much covered you guys throughout that 10 years. I think it's been eight years I've been, I've been doing this. One thing that stood out um, that seemed to be a frustration was, um, you know, getting this FPIL deal over the line, uh, whether it was something in Hong Kong with a regulator or whatever, because we're looking back, you know, is that is that one thing? Is there anything you'd have done differently um, with that, or in any of the other spaces when you're looking back over this ten years? What would you have done differently? Okay, well, speaking about Hong Kong, I wouldn't have done it any differently. It took longer to achieve what we wanted, but we got the structure we wanted in, and set up the way we wanted it to be set up. So the fact it took longer, but we got the right result is just one of those things. Not everyone dances to your own timetable. They have their own. Similarly, some of the takeovers we've done, they haven't happened exactly when I wanted to have them. You have to wait until there's a willing vendor, for example. And sometimes, you know, that's not always to the same timetable you might have. So you have to accept, I think, that if people are going to sell you a company, they've got their own parameters, how they sell it. Similarly, a regulator might say, we want to do things in a certain way and it's not how you intended. So you have to work with them. You can't fight regulators. You just can't. You have to work with them. And they're not bad people. They're trying to do what's right for them and for their country. And we're the other side of the world and we have to adapt. So the Hong Kong regulators have been through a lot of change. It's part of a political environment which is being through a lot of change. It was badly affected by COVID. So you can't stand up and say, I demand that, you know, this company is bought in exactly this way on this date, just because I say so. You know, they've got, so I, I think I've learned perhaps to be more patient and more understanding of other cultures and other, other regulators because of being in this sector. Um, so I don't, and the, and the regulators are trying to protect their, their, their population from, unfortunately, some bad practices of the past, not necessarily in our sector, but even so. So they've got a job to do and they see those as protection of their environment is number one. So we have to acknowledge that when we deal with them. So I've got no problems dealing with a Hong Kong regulator. Um, it can not move at the pace that we're used to dealing with in an Anglo-Saxon environment. But that's um, that's part of the joys of international space is getting better at that and understanding it better. And we do all the time. So it would have been nice to be quicker in Hong Kong. But we've got a structure that we're really happy with and works well so no complaints from me any regrets yeah i think because we weren't very big and we're still not the biggest group in the world um you can't juggle too many plates and there's been other opportunities come up in different and were parts of the world or different sectors where we perhaps could have entered into the mna fray but we were sort of already tied up with friends provident or something else uh, so I think perhaps in the early days, I would have been a bit braver uh, looking back on it and pushing hard to try and do things, spin a few more plates. But as my colleagues always tell me, they're the ones who have to do all the work. I just set the plates spilling and then go and look for more plates to spin. Uh, I don't actually have to integrate the IT or integrate the people. So, uh, but I think um, broadly, I have no regrets. Um, I think we've done most things how I would have wanted, but there are a couple of opportunities I perhaps didn't pursue hard enough. In retrospect, we should have made more of an effort. I'm not going to name them, and they might not necessarily be obvious ones that you might be thinking of, slightly different sectors and things. Um, so I will um, now we've got new investors who are also uh, keen to help us spend money and invest money. We'll be pushing hard again. 
good to good to know. I was going to ask about about Simvin. The one thing that's, um, you know, this is is this the third third lot of um, private equity that you've been involved. No, second. In? Second lot. Yeah, the management buyout was in November thirteen, uh, ten years ago, give or take, and um, that was with Vitruvian. Yes, I went excellent relationship with Vitruvian. Um, they really understood us from day one. We worked together. We had the same aims. It's just, it's just. So my experience, of private equity is very positive, but you have to have very clear objectives and you have to deliver on those objectives. That's not unreasonable. They've invested a lot of money in the company, and Sinven, it's early days, but it's shaping up exactly the same. So they are bigger than Vitruvian. They've got deeper pockets, more firepower. Also, we're in a specialist financial services fund with a slightly long, longer term horizon to it. So they can take a long-term view. The all the partners and, and and support people in that fund are only deal with financial services. So there's a deep level of expertise, deep level of contacts in the sector. Uh, so I'm pretty excited, and so far so good. I mean, we're still learning e about each other. It's like a marriage in the first year. So, but uh, so far excellent. Good, good to hear. One sort of quickish question, but it's kind of, and it's a tricky one, I'm sure, but look at the industry landscape in 2013. What's the biggest change been? And we've both seen a lot of changes in a shortish spe space of time. What's the biggest change when you look at our landscape? I think, I might extend my answer, but I think off the top of my head, I, I see two changes that are fundamental to the industry. The first is regulation and governance. Um, and they're not always exactly the same thing. Some regulation is specific and rule-based. Some governance is framework-based, how you as a company have to behave or the management team. And that has completely changed in the last 10 years, mostly for the better in my view. I could always cherry pick about one or two rules, but. It is now a better governance industry with better outcomes for customers uh, than it was 12, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I'm not, I don't think this is one state. I don't, I don't matter for its product providers, advisors, regulators. We've all changed and grown up over the last 10 to 12 years. The result of that is that to survive and thrive in that more heavily governance world, you have to be bigger, tougher, and more resourced. That lends itself, whether you're an advisor or a product provider, to being bigger and stronger and having better structures, which means there's less room for small minnows, advisors, or product providers. In some ways, that's a shame. Maybe some of the entrepreneurship some of the fleet of foot product development therefore isn't quite so easy to achieve. So the big change as a result of the governance is that providers and advisors are already trending and will continue to trend to being bigger and stronger. That will lead to continuing mergers, in my opinion. It's already been happening amongst the product providers for several years, as you know. But it's also happening amongst the advisors. We've seen various takeovers, mergers, private equity backed uh, advisor structures. So that will continue. To be a truly international advisor now, you need strong governance, strong structures, deeper pockets, better reputation. And the good advisors are achieving that, but it's the same for providers, platforms, life companies, investment managers, you need to be either big and strong or be very fleet of foot with a very particular USP if you want to uh, thrive in the market. David, thanks so much for your time. I know you're busy and it's a real pleasure to look back on these things with you. And, um, you know, long may it continue. There's no question in, in here, by the way, of me saying, you know, how long is it going to continue? Because there's no need to do that. We're not ageist in, the, in this new world that we live in. Long may it continue. As long as you're enjoying it, I hope uh, to see you for many more years to come. Thank you, Gary. And thank you for international investment support, not just for us, but for the industry. I think it's really important. 
uh, there's not a huge amount of uh, sort of structured commentary and publicity out there. And I think it's really important that organisations like yourself exist and continue to thrive. So thank you, for, I think, on behalf of all the industry, all the CEOs, thanks for your support. Really appreciate it. And um, we're going nowhere. We're, we're, uh, we're set in and Mark and I are a, are a very, very different pairing, but we're a, we're a good solid team and um, yeah, long may it continue.